Okay. Okay. Fine. So, good morning. So, buongiorno, guten tag. Uh, it's, of course, very honored for me to be here. I'd like to thank Tom for the invitation and all the organizers. And I'll be talking about some interesting results. Uh, the, we are being obtained uh, from visual interpretation of satellite image time series. But actually, the talk is not about this. But well, this is the excuse. Because we actually are going to have another round of the EO World Cup. Lineups, okay? Do you know this guy beside myself? Who knows him? Who has seen him play? Pele, okay. And then Croatia. Who's the guy? Luka Modric. And then Ezra, do you know who's beside you? Johan Cruyff, one of the greatest players of the game. And where's Martin Harold, the German, classic German player? Hans Beckenbauer, great chapter. And then, of course, you have the ubiquitous big brother with Megan and Matt Hansen, and they are represented here by Lindsay. And finally, Stefan Fritz, but I guess not even Stefan knows the name of this Austrian player. Anyone knows? Alaba, yes. Good, so the lineups are there, and we're ready to start. So what is this talk about? Well, of course, the underlying question, immediate technical question is, by the way, we fight a lot in the World Cup, but of course we discuss, but we remain, as Tom likes to say, friends and have a pizza after. But of course, the question that comes uh, before a technical question is how best to use machine learning to measure tropical deforestation in Amazonia. But this actual question begs another two questions. Uh, one is that exactly the one that we've been discussing back and forth. Uh, is there an objective truth in Earth's observation? And by objective truth, I remember a discussion I had with Peter the other day, where Peter was arguing about an objective truth that the data would be speak for itself, and uh, you would be able, based on the certain responses from certain bands, to uncover whatever is that the satellite is seeing. Uh, no prizes for guessing that I will be arguing otherwise. And a more important question, at least from the economical point of view, what happens when EO is used for compliance? So let me start with uh, the last question first, because that's the one, that's the billion dollar question. As you may know, Brazil has a long-standing system of uh, mapping deforestation, which is the authoritative data. When I say authoritative data, I mean that's the official data used by the government, not only by the government, but used for compliance by banks, by the public attorneys, uh, to, and by the Norwegian government and German government. Now, I think Switzerland and, and, and US have also contributed to the so-called Amazon Fund, which provides support for projects, including this one, which I'm talking about. So basically when they put funds into Brazil, uh, Norway measures the progress by making sure that deforestation goes down. So when deforestation went up in the Bolsonaro years, Norway said, we're not giving money until deforestation goes down. So it's, it's normative in this sense. And so now we're not talking about project money, we're talking about billions. Of course, now the, quest, the, 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 the stakes are growing because you have the EU regulation on deforestation-free products, I'm sure you're all aware of, and which is, of course, discussing things like JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva, these are cattle, uh, these are meat companies. JBS is the biggest producer of meat in the world. And of course, there is a whole debate on uh, financial risk from deforestation and market chains and so on. So uh, 
begs the question, how good must Earth observation deforestation maps be for compliance enforcement? Is it sufficient that they have uh, overall accuracy of 80%? By God, no. You need to be able to identify each and every single place or farm or part of the farm that has been deforested. Assign it to someone who is the owner for to guarantee compliance and to make sure that you don't get false positives. So this is today's The Guardian that says top grain traders help scupper Ben in Sawyer from deforested land. So this is the argument that uh, people are trying to fake the data. Look at The Guardian. And then uh, some months ago, The Guardian came up and says, these, these guys were selling carbon credits and these credits are worthless. And I, I'm just saying that these are debates that are going well beyond our traditional OEMC debates. And just to take item 31 of the EU deforestation, free goods regulation, states that EU, I know if Patrick Griffiths is around, but, uh, oh, hey, Patrick. Uh, it's, um, the EU is going to create an EU observatory on deforestation, degradation, change in the world forest cover and associated drivers to better monitor change in the world's forest cover and related drivers. This is taken from the regulation. And I, when I read that, I had the idea of the Chinese. Well, be careful what you wish for. Because what happens if the EU observatory produces bad results for Brazil? Brazil will sue Europe in that WTO and win. So you better be careful that what comes out is bulletproof because this is not going to be used for papers. This is going to be used to block people from selling goods to the EU. So, Mr. Tom, I love to debate with you the issues of global, local, or global. And this has been going on, and this probably will, at the project, we will end long before we reach a consensus. But let me explain what I mean. When you have, this is three maps, same area. So that's the Sentinel-2 image of Rondonia State, a part of Rondonia State in 2021. This is the Prodis map, also yellow means deforestation, and green means forest. And this is the GLAD alerts. And GLAD is, contrary to what people say, is not a global forest watch, but a global tree watch. Because it says, look at the area, which I have highlighted, there's a massive loss of trees there. Well, <laughs> it so happens that that area, if you go back to the Sentinel image, it's a wetland. Who has a pulse? And the pulse goes back and forth during the year. So depending on the day, if you're doing a survey of the Amazon by taking a single date or the best date, you may not distinguish an area which is covered by water, by an area which is essentially the same area, but is dry. There's a huge pulse, and now, of course, due to El Nino, it's even worse. So you have to make sure that you get your data right so as not to be able to make, well, technically speaking, this is not a mistake. This is just, there's no way, and back to the objective truth, Peter, is this, you're measuring what they did, Glad was measure tree loss when, when first, when the, the area was flooded, and then in the dry area, and they put up tree loss where there's actually no tree loss. This is a completely natural phenomenon. So in that sense, they may claim, okay, but this is, I never claimed this was deforestation. So don't claim that the data from Global Forest Watch can measure deforestation if you're making mistakes like that. As simple as that. So if you do global, what have you to do? So this is an experiment that we did in Rondonia, Brazil, which is an area which has been messed up 
very much, a lot of deforestation, a lot of small areas, a lot of farms, a very endangered place. And the benchmark is not your common paper that you submit to International Journal of Remote Sensor, Remote Sensor of Environment, that accepts uh, uh, papers with 80% F1 score. This is basically the gold standard, which is visual interpretation by skilled experts who actually look at every single image individually by eye and identify on the screen new areas of deforestation. So my question is, beat that. Beat that. So to beat that, you have to start by asking the basic questions. The basic question that we ask about nature is always, what's out there? And implicitly or explicitly, we make some assumptions. We make the assumption that reality exists independent from human representations. It's out there. We make the second premise, otherwise Copernicus, we would not be in this room, that we have access to the world through our observations, otherwise we would not be here. A third assumption is that, the language assumption, that words refer to objects in the world. So far, so good. Now, the problem is starts here is the famous Tarski correspondence theory of truth. Our statements are true or false, depending on whether they correspond to the facts in the real world. And that's where me and Peter started, what's a forest? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on who is asking the question and how the question is framed. So, as we would see from Frege, what we are doing all the time when we're doing Earth observation, classification, we're basically ascribing meaning to nature. And the question is, do we do it in ob an objective way? But let's see what's the minimum base standard where we start from. Well, we start from, at the, and, and this is, of course, my credo, and you're not obliged to, to believe on it, that you get better results. So if you look back to this, uh, glad, this is basically a comparison which I called space first time later. You process space, and then after you process one image, per year, typically the best image for a certain year, then you compare across time. And the way we are doing and we prefer to do, and uh, I think uh, this experiment sort of satisfies our goals, we say, do time first, space later. Take the time series. And why? Why do you take the time series? Because the time series indicates change in a much better way than other alternatives do. And given that we have now Sentinels, uh, much better satellites with much better uh, temporal coverage, we can really understand changes that happen in the landscape in a way that was impossible when we had one Landsat image. And we paid $1,000 for it. So as you know, I mean, of course, a preacher of SITS. SITS is not a magic bullet, it's just a system that works. And basically it's based on building data cubes, rely extensively on EDSA's work from SF and uh, EDSA's uh, with Myers from GDAO cubes. It would not exist if EDSA had not done his good work. And of course, Robert with Terra. So it's basically dependent on a lot of good people that helped us and we train the samples. And what we do, of course, just to get you the techies here, we obtain and harmonize uh, versus ready data. And that's where the debate about uh, regularization is so important. Without regularization, we cannot do this. So basically, we build, use GDAO cubes, just for the record, to build a data cube. 
and then on the other side would collect training data. We have a huge amount of functions to do quality control, uh, including uh, sample normalization and uh, assessment of samples and quality control and train the data set, including machine learning methods, then classify the probabilities and then smoothen the probabilities, use accuracy assessment. There's a lot there, not going to detail. You look at the CITS website, but, Back to Rondonia. So the obvious thing here would say, okay, what can happen? And it's important because we're dealing with events, things that happen, not objects, things that they are. So we're, in order to capture deforestation, you have to say, what is the process that leads to deforestation? For example, there was a clear cut that leads to a bare soil. There was a clear cut who left some vegetation there. The guy just cut and left some remnants there. There was a clear cut where the guy put fire. Okay, and then we said, that's fine. That's fine. We classify, we've been doing this for a year. Just a little bit after the last workshop, we started a team there. And we have a team of uh, not only software developers, but three P, uh, one senior PhD, two postdocs and one PhD student, so all in remote sensing. So the, the, the team on application is bigger than the software development guys. So we said, okay, fine, fantastic, we got it. No, we hadn't. We, we went back to the same errors as those I showed in the GLAD data. So we had to adapt back to my friend Peter Strobel, we had to look specifically at the problem we were facing and derive classes for that problem. For example, a class of seasonally flooded areas because they exist on that region. A class of riparian forests, which are forests which are nearby land and they may dry or may not dry out. So in the seasonally flooded areas, the whole area is flooded in terms of riparian flooded, they get some waterish during the year. And without these additional, uh, these are all forests, but without these additional nature classes. But in other words, in not, if we didn't know what we needed to find about the data in that region, we would not be able to select the right classes. It's very context dependent. Oops. Okay, so you can see it better when you see the uh, time uh, series patterns. And this is actually uh, from Victor Maus. Where is Victor? Oh, Victor Maus here, which was my PhD student. Now he's a brilliant researcher of his own. And you see clearly the signs. This is NDVI, EVI, and NBR. So you see nicely how things which are very hard, if you take one date, appear much more clearly in the time series. So you see the difference between clear cut and bare soil, clear cut and fire. You have forest, you have riparian forest, which is a little bit different. Clear cut with vegetation, which if you if you were not very careful, you you would get mixed with riparian forest, where riparian forest is natural and clear cut is human actions. You have seasonally flooded areas that you want, and they're quite different from wetlands and so on. So whilst the, the, the classifier is very happy with these classes. And that's what you get. You get a pretty good map. Pretty good. 95% uh, agreement with the visual interpretation. Beat that. Beat that. If you're willing to say, I'm going to, to measure tropical deforestation in Amazon, there's a benchmark here waiting for you. So you know, we're going to put actually what we're going to do as part of the OMC project is to put one Sentinel tile with those samples. So you beat that. And therefore you'll see here on the left side is the visual interpretation. On the right side is the polygons we found. I mean, not perfect yet, but very close. So what did we find? Well, 
back to my discussion with Peter, there are many ways to cut a multidimensional cake. You can cut it on a certain way, you can cut it another way. So the, there, literally in a, in a space, remember what kind of data we're talking about. We're talking about 24 instances of Sentinel data of a data cube every 15 days times all the Sentinel bands times index. So take uh, roughly, it's a space of dimensions 240, just to get, so a space of dimension 240 can be clustered in many, many, many ways. And it depends heavily on the training data. So don't believe me if you want to believe Vapnik, which is, is as you know, the father of uh, SVM. And Vapnik says, uh, machine learning shows that there are examples of complex worlds. We should approach complex worlds from a completely different position than simple worlds. In a complex world, one should, should give up explainability to gain a better predictability. And that's the whole credo. I'm not saying I believe on this credo. But it's news, as news boys, it's rumored to say to someone who was complaining about the uh, quantum mechanics Copenhagen interpretation, shut up and calculate. It works. So basically, what have we learned? Okay. If you're doing real world Earth observation for compliance, for EU deforestation goods, for market chains, you know, good is not enough. You gotta be spot on. You cannot miss. You have to be, you have to be mindful that there are billions at stake. So good luck with the EU Observatory, European Commission. If you miss Brazil, Brazil is going to put you in WTO and we're going to win. There is no objective truth when we're using machine learning in Earth observation. Just too many ways to cut the multidimensional cake. So training classes are context dependent. And that's the my main argument for the global, in other words, of the global. It's, this is not to say that global maps don't have a place. They do have a place and they are important. It is important that we know in general what is happening to the world. But they are never, will never be good enough to be used for compliance. When you're talking about compliance, when you're talking about assigning blame to individuals, who have to pay for their mistakes and their crimes, global data will not achieve high accuracy. It's impossible. Or it is possible if you treat global data as local data. So you go and say, okay, I'm going to build a map. I'm going to get Rondonia first, and I'm going to map this part of the Congo base. I'm going to map Cameroon, and then I'm going to go to Borneo and North Borneo and South Borneo will be different. And I'm going to Sumatra, and I'm going to have training classes for Sumatra. I'm going to have training classes for Vietnam. Good luck with that. And finally, time first, space later. For me, is the key to measure deforestation and then land use and land cover. And with that, I close and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gibato, for the engaging conversation. Any questions, comments? Thanks, Gilbert. I really like your view on this. Um, so from a, let's say from a statistical perspective, this whole discussion, time first, space later, space first, time later, is kind of uh, seen off as, yeah, you do this because, because doing them in an integrated fashion is too complicated, right? But if you think about a problem, why would you do one after the other? Why would you not try and approach where you both consider the temporal dynamics and the context. And there I'm, I'm thinking, I'm reading about approaches where people have, uh, well, for instance, neural network that are convolutional and LSTM and so on, combine these things into, into one mechanism. What do you think about that? Okay, I think, first of all, you're right. What 
in the latest version of SITS 142, which is coming on CRAN sometime this month, we have now uh, taken some with Jakub Novosad, who is not here, but if you think, see him, thank him, of uh, spatial temporal segmentation. So we do spatial temporal segmentation. And then inside the segments, we take either the median or we take some of the samples and we classify them. And uh, this is, this is uh, the problem is how do you arrive at a spatial temporal segmentation? For the moment, we're relying a little bit on what extending the work of Jakub Novosad. So in 142 states, we're gonna, we have segmentation running. But, you know, but the point here, segmentation just segments to, to get the boundaries better. You still want to represent these variations because this is crucial to say this is happening. Otherwise you stuck, for example, with you don't, if you don't get, for example, riparian forest, they probably end up, in the, in that, that's exactly the case that they did. If you look at the responses, they, many of the riparian forest uh, points, which we did not have a class to represent them, ended up as clear cut with vegetation, similarly to what Glad found. And of course, this is wrong. But the, the classifier puts them somewhere if you don't tell the classifier what to look for. So you have to train the classifier, you have to tell the classifier what to look for and how should the classifier partition the multidimensional space. More questions? Um, can I just come in from remote? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Gilberto, great, great presentation. Sorry, I got a bit sick, so I'm still in the hotel coming later, but I followed your presentation. I'm very interesting what you said also on the EU observatory. Um, I think, you know, that they are increasingly becoming aware that they don't want to put out anything legally binding. I think they are, have already understood that there might be some consequences with the uh, World Trade Organization, but they want to now get um, suppliers. So those um, suppliers providing polygons. So I think there needs, there will be a much more detailed analysis on this polygon. So essentially is each good imported on this specific deforestation free product specified oil palm and so forth, they will then get um, a polygon attached to it. And this goes in the database and a certain percentage of these polygons will then be checked, but they will have to be checked by the companies themselves. I think that's the way the commission wants to move forward. Just, just for information, I don't mm -hmm. know to what degree you're in this discussion, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. And uh, I think you're right. I think that, but I, I was basically referring to the, the, the document which was approved by the parliament. Uh, wait, and by the way, one of the reasons why we're doing all this effort, you know, why, why should you do the all crazy effort, put people working for years uh, when you have produce is because we want to make sure that Brazil is in a position to give to whoever, commission or whoever wants, uh, the scripts and the data to exactly rep. So we're moving this to vis from visual to machine learning at a, at a certain point to be able to say to commission or whoever, reproduce my data. Here's my data. Here's my analysis. Here are my scripts. So if you want to see what I'm seeing, just run these scripts. So this is what Brazil is preparing to, to be able to, to carry out and say, okay, you want to verify what I do? That's here, reproduce it. That's so much for Ezra and his reproducible scripts, right? Good discussions we had with him. So, I mean, Brazil is sort of hedging its bets in, in this story because we're preparing for a debate, which I think is very good and very serious, and to be able to run this debate on equal terms. Let's just go, uh, sorry, because of time. Uh, let's just go with uh, uh, Peter Strobel has a question. Uh, sorry, sorry, Gilberto. Oh, pa Patrick's also, sorry. Gilberto, I was wondering if there's any intention to get away from purely training data-driven approaches. I mean, we have such a data-rich environment now. You have such rich time series features. I know for compliance, you know, training data-driven approaches are still probably more accurate, but don't we want to get away from purely training data-driven machine learning approaches? more go to you know features of the time series themselves well that's a good debate patrick 
I, I'm more, let's put it this way, I'm more skeptical of this than I was one year ago. Because what we are finding is that, first of all, you don't have a lot of training data in terms of time series. You certainly don't have a lot of training data and time series which relates to the environment of tropical forests in the Amazon, which might be different from tropical forests in Congo and Indonesia, certainly don't. The data that is has produced by us, you don't, I mean, I've looked around, I haven't seen it. And therefore, at this point, we have no substitute to look for. We have to generate the training data. So what we found is that, um, because you have to understand the landscape. You've been to the landscape, you know, that is a dynamic landscape and you have to have people who understand it. So my point is, uh, I would love not to need a lot of training data, but I am afraid as I do now, maybe in one year we'll talk later and see what happens. Uh, we could not get away without a huge investment on, I mean, many iterations of producing maps, many iterations of training data. The time spent for actually number crunching is peanuts compared to the time spent on uh, training data. You're right, I love that it would be the case. Uh, let's just go to Peter and then we close. Uh, just the last question. Yeah, just, just briefly too, because I think that could easier, it would be a good discussion to have in Earth observation, by the way, generally what you uh, said there about truth and about everything else, but that goes way too far here. But starting with truth, I would never use that word in the context of describing nature. There is no truth. Uh, nature is an indefinitely complex phenomenon around us. And what we, are, what we can do, the only possibility we have is through measurements and observations, get parts of it, abstractions, samples. And the important thing of that is that you always have to keep in mind that that, that, that is just a part of, of that reality. But if you do not accept that there is that, that is the only thing you can have, then you can call everything reality. And that brings me back to what you say. If you say, I give you an algorithm and that will give you reality, then I can say I have another algorithm and it gives me reality as well. Whose reality is the better reality? And then we have to start to get back to the roots and say, can we define the reality on which we agree? And, and I think that's really the, the problem we will have to face in compliance, in climate change and everything. We will need to define the facts on, on which are not a matter of belief or not, but which are really what we, what we, what we base on science. And, and we should not water that down by saying, I have an algorithm that gives a better observation or a better uh, uh, abstraction of reality than, than, than you, because that is a, a, a slippery path. Yeah, I agree with that. I couldn't I was, agree more, Peter. Just, uh, yeah, just, just agree 100%. To, to, we slip into some philosophical discussions. So. Okay. Uh, I think what uh, Gilbert wanted to say, there's no absolute truth, but uh, in the context, you know, I would still say that observation is the most objective way we can approach monitoring the, the um, uh, earth surface, right? Um, but just, Gilbert, just to, uh, two things. You mentioned this uh, um, time before space, and you mentioned this golden star, 95% accuracy, but there are publications also, right? The, for bo both of the methods well, publications. Well, you know, you know the story. If you have a good idea, publish it. If you have a really good idea, patent it. I mean, uh, for me, uh, I, I mean, there are 1,400 publications that cite produce. So in nature, science, there are about 200. But so currently, this is... But at the more... But the only thing I want to say, can you share us a matter most? Send us where we can read. Oh, it. yes, That's yes, I'll do. I know. But I was going okay. to say... For me, it's more important that Norway has put a billion dollars on, on believing on produce. For me, this is the proof of the pudding. When you put real money where your mouth is, this is, this is another game. You see, one game is the paper game. The other game is where the billions are. It's the forestation free goods regulation. It's, uh, it's like uh, credits for red. It's the real game where that earth, that's where 
we have been called by the Commission, by Brazil, by the United States, by the UNFCCC to make Earth's observation meaningful. And uh, by me, I measure meaningfulness by not the number of papers I produce, but how much money can I put into Brazil or promote Brazilian exports. This is my, my benchmark now, because that's a real benchmark that I can pass on to my descendants. Okay, let's thank